Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming to today's convening. We'll get started at one o'clock. Hello, how's it going? Great, Joseph, how are you? I'm doing good, thanks. Good. The sun is shining and that's always refreshing for me. I love having the sun shine. No doubt. Yeah, yesterday it was a little hot. Today it's gorgeous. It's like 65 yeah. and sunny. Mm -hmm. I dropped my son off at summer camp today and they shared that they're going to have ice cream, an ice cream social this afternoon and that it's national ice cream day. Oh, I didn't see, look I didn't that know. up, but <laughs> I'm going to get some oh. ice cream later today. Yeah, I, I think that's a great idea. Yeah. Good afternoon to those who have just come into our virtual space this afternoon. Just doing a brief sound check and to let you know that you are in the right virtual space. We'll begin at one o'clock. Good afternoon, Lindsay. I hope you're doing well today. 
I'm good. How are you, Precious? I'm wonderful. Got it. Okay, I do have one o'clock on my end. So we're going to go ahead and get started for uh, out of respect for all of your time today. Good afternoon. My name is Precious Miller. I am the Director of Basic Needs and Belonging. I am an African American woman with short, uh, dark brown curly hair. And it's a pleasure to be here. Um, today we're going to be talking about navigating digital accessibility. And I do have a few slides to share before I turn things over to Bay College, who is our college feature for today's convening. On the slide deck, the first slide, there is some language along with an ingrained image of a cloud with three connecting cords to that cloud, signifying um, digital uh, accessibility. And so um, in our conversations today, I'm going to share our agenda of how we're going to spend our time. So on the agenda slide, there is another ingrained image of an hourglass along with a calendar, signifying how we'll spend our time for the next hour today. We're going to get, begin with some welcome and introductions. I hope that you feel comfortable bringing um, your full self to this virtual space. If you are able to uh, type into the chat, you can share um, information that you feel comfortable sharing, such as your name, the institution that you're representing, and your role at your institution. And if you feel so inclined, perhaps you might share the highlight of your summer thus far, or something you might be looking forward to within the next couple of months as we continue to enjoy a coveted Michigan summer. Following our welcome and introductions, I'm going to share some digital accessibility updates of things that you can expect from uh, Michigan Community College Association and how we are looking to continue to support the efforts at your institution. Then we will turn the baton over to Bay College to share the ways in which they are prioritizing and supporting the digital accessibility needs of their students, followed by some discussion, question and answer. And then we'll end with talking about next steps pertaining to uh, the Digital Accessibility Affinity Group, along with um, some um, upcoming events that you can expect to hear more about and how you can stay connected to stay in the know about what is coming um, for the rest of this uh, year. So earlier this spring, we had a conversation with those who are leaders in digital accessibility at Michigan Community Colleges, really to serve as a listening opportunity for us at MCCA to become more aware of the um, things that are top of mind at your institution and ways in which MCCA can continue to support your efforts. 
From that listening session, we gathered a lot of information, but things that are top of mind and, and items that institutions are prioritizing is what I wanted to highlight in our conversation today. So from that listening session, we heard that a lot of colleges are looking to better understand what to prioritize. Sometimes um, when we are thinking about diversity, equity, inclusion, inclusion, belonging, and accessibility, it can feel like we're mopping the ocean. So where do we start and how do we prioritize that, um, both physically and financially at our institutions? Some colleges were also interested in learning more about closed captioning policies that are in existence at other colleges, along with how do we in, um, include American Sign Language for digital events and broadcasting live events, followed by training for staff and faculty, how do we get support um, at our institution and regarding uh, accessibility issues for students who are looking to access campus materials, internet, and um, other resources. So in response to the things that are top of mind priorities for colleges, we pulled together a list of items and activities that we can support um, engagement in. And one of those activities is the development of the Digital Accessibility Affinity Group that Hallie McGee, who is on the call, has been so gracious to uh, support the development of. Along with uh, the Digital Accessibility uh, Affinity Group, we have some events that we would like to facilitate. The first one being this one, uh, Navigating Digital Inclusivity. So if this is the topic that you were interested in today, you are in the right space. In the fall, we are also setting our sights on pulling in some resources from the state of Michigan. Michigan has developed uh, the High Speed Internet Office to offer uh, resources to close the digital divide in Michigan. So I am um, looking to pull them into the conversation to do a, a, an overview of state resources that colleges can pull on to support the needs of their students. We are also setting our sights to develop partnership with Disability Network of Southwest Michigan. I had a fantastic call with them this morning and they are interested in partnering with us. And so we are hoping that they would be able to offer some presentations around ways that colleges can continue to prioritize uh, digi digital um, justice, disability justice, along with ways we can access and utilize practical strategies to promote inclusive learning environments, followed by an affinity group meeting towards the end of the year to talk about things that are top of mind for your institution, as well as current um, trends at your college and technology trends as we go into the 2024 uh, calendar year. Now, these activities are great, but I understand that sometimes finances can be a challenge to continue um, uplifting some of these efforts. So I did want to share a couple of grant opportunities that are coming out of the Office of Michigan College Access Network. There are currently two grants, 60 by 30 Adult Student Success Grant, which offers $200,000 over the span of two years. And this is really focusing on um, adult learners, those from Futures for Frontliners or Reconnect who are returning to our college spaces and ways to increase uh, retention and completion of these individuals. And then there is another grant, the Immigrant Student Success Grant. They are offering $150,000 over the span of 18 months to specifically support immigrant, international, and first-generation college students and in increasing their enrollment and retention. I am going to put a, a more descriptive um, link that you all can access in the chat to learn more about this. So uh, during the spring, we had our listening session that I mentioned earlier, and we heard some really great um, activities that are coming out of Bay College. On your screen here, there is a PowerPoint snapshot that I grabbed from Bay College's website that overshadows um, 
a welcome to Bay College, and it states learn on campus and online, and it states Bay is the way. And so with that, I am going to turn things over to the team at Bay to share more about what they are currently doing to support this work. And hopefully you guys are able to share your screen. If not, we'll navigate something else. Thanks a lot, Precious. Thanks for inviting us. Um, <clears throat> digital accessibility, web accessibility is something that is close and, and, and personal to me. Um, it's, uh, I guess, maybe been through the people that I've had in my life that have introduced me to the need for web accessibility, starting with uh, uh, an instructor at the University of Toledo. Uh, I used to drive bus, and he was uh, he was a blind individual from uh, Africa, and his name was Sak Sakwi Malakwa, and uh, he was just an amazing person, and um, so talented, uh, you know, professor. Um, he also played uh, concert piano, and, and he was just an amazing person, but, um, you know, he he really needed, um, you know, that uh, extra level of support to be able to access information. And so uh, he was uh, one of the first people that I met that kind of uh, introduced me to that realm. And, um, you know, as a father with a couple of kids on IEPs, I see that uh, universal design for learning is, is just more and more crucial. So it is something that is near and dear to me. When I first started here at Bay College, it was something that there's a bit of a gap here at Bay College uh, addressing web accessibility. And um, I, I became very good friends actually with the director of uh, accessibility and the Office of Accessibility. And we're still really good friends to this day. Um, and we work together on a lot of really good initiatives. And um, what I will say is that what, what has helped us along the way is a really strong web accessibility policy. And so I guess I just wanted to initially uh, share that with you. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen um, and uh, see what I can do here. Just give me one second. I said to turn on something here so I can do this. Let me try this again. Okay. How's that? You see that? Okay. Okay, cool. Um, so this started out as the electronic and information technology. Uh, it started, it's changed names several times over the years. Um, but really, this is our, you know. This is our policy. This is our call to attention to all of our employees on the need and, and, and the necessity to, to be accessible. And so I actually was on the um, the uh, accessible the web accessibility committee where we help write uh, some of this policy where it was lacking. And this is a very detailed policy speaking um, not only about web but all electronic and information technology systems that include uh, our intranet. Right, which is my bay, and it's a Genzabar product, but also our internet and our, you know, our our website, and so um, it is. It's trying to cover everything that we would offer to our students, all software purchases, um, you know, that they need to be accessible, and that we have a committee to address accessibility concerns. Um, the EIT Accessibility Committee is the committee that I worked on for a while to create some of this language. We have very specific language in here on um, what accessibility is and that employees are responsible for creating and updating web content. So the employees that update the web content, they're also responsible to make sure that that web content is accessible. Um, and we have very, you know, specific language in here about WCAG, right, which is the Web Content uh, Accessibility Guidelines. So this is really our foundation to uh, a, lot, the, a lot of the success that we've had at Bay College over the years. Um, but it not only applies to um, our website intranets, but all the documents uploaded into our course management systems. So syllabi, you know, handouts, PowerPoints, uh, you name it, all of those things are covered in this policy. And it's a it's a call to action to all people that are uploading digital information um, to 
to, to be knowledgeable about web accessibility. You know, with the increasing effectiveness of artificial intelligence, I'm hoping that will really help uh, to create more accessible documents, websites, and so forth. But uh, the long and the short of it comes down to it really depends on the person being familiar with some of those really important things like alt tags and captions and, you know, uh, headings and all that kind of good stuff, descriptive URLs and all of this kind of stuff. So, um, you know, this policy does a really good detailed job of just laying it all out there. And so what I will say to institutions that may not have a web accessibility policy, it is absolutely crucial and a very, very important first step to tackle uh, is, is to write a web accessibility policy. So um, that's really all I wanted to, to, to say at the beginning there, lay the foundation, and I'm going to hand it over to um, to Lindsay uh, to, uh, to, to review our web accessibility certification course. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing. Thanks, Joseph. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay, great. All right, I am going to share my screen. And can everybody see my screen okay? All right, so today I'm going to talk about our web accessibility uh, certification course, as well as uh, training that we offer to Bay College employees related to web accessibility. Specifically, I'm going to start off just with our web accessibility certification course that really is the foundation for uh, training people at Bay um, around web accessibility. Um, the certification course is in our learning management so system Blackboard, um, and it teaches learners how to apply skills and knowledge on um, accessible digital materials. It is a four week asynchronous cohort style course. There's four modules, a module per week. Um, anyone at Bay as an employee can take the course, faculty, staff, part-time workers. Um, and it uses a comprehensive kind of step-by-step -step video tutorial approach, which I really like because not only does it give you the foundation and the knowledge, but then we actually have videos that say, okay, now we're going to show you how to apply these principles using the resources available to um, our employees, like our learning management system, our lecture capture service, et cetera. Um, outside of the web accessibility certification course, we offer a couple other modalities on training. Um, we do facilitate one-on-one -on -one Zoom training sessions. These are really like boot camp style, about an hour. Um, basics of web accessibility. We obviously cannot cover everything that is in the web accessibility course, but um, I we, we try to at least touch on everything um, or something in each module to give a nice overview. Um, that is, you know, if we aren't offering the cohort at that time or we just don't have enough people at that time, we can deliver that one-on-one -on -one training. Um, we also will sometimes put people in the course and have them go through it more independent study style um, where they're just going through the modules and um, you know, learning about the material, but they don't have that cohort to um, engage and, with and discuss in the discussion boards. Um, but if, again, we don't have a full cohort at the time that it's needed, we can offer that. We also offer a uh, student accessibility course for student workers. And again, it is um, centered around our web accessibility certification course. It is um, pretty much all the same information, the same modules, but it is more independent study style and aimed for our student workers. So our web accessibility certification course, um, it consists of a start here module, a syllabus and a schedule. Um, those are all three components that are required for uh, Bay College's online and hybrid courses. So we like to model good behavior by including those. Um, and then we have uh, students engage in a building empathy and belonging discussion board. Um, and I'm going to show you that real quick. Um, so this is the discussion board in our uh, learning management system uh, Blackboard. 
we have students watch one of these four videos, um, their TED videos, and each of the videos have um, someone who has certain challenges or difficulties that they um, have to face in their everyday life and they talk about them. Um, for example, Phil Hansen um, had this shake that was developed over time, um, but he was an artist and so it definitely affected um, his life as an artist. So he talks about how he embraced that. Um, and then they have to reply by imagining that one of these people um, are a Bay College student and um, ask them to consider how we can make them feel welcome specifically in the area of web accessibility. And this is purposely placed at the beginning of the course um, so that we can enter into the modules um, from a place of empathy. Um, and it also brings out a lot of good conversation about you know, oh, this family member has this challenge or I've had to face this challenge and it just helps people um, remember, you know, that we all have different things that we're facing and um, to build that empathy before we go into the modules. The first module um, just, it goes over accessibility universal design principles. It references the um, 1945 petition of Kalamazoo for curb cuts, which originally was for um, injured veterans, but uh, later it showed that it was actually helpful for many different travelers like bicyclists and people with strollers, etc. cetera. Um, but this module really uh, talks about, you know, the federal state regulations, um, the fact that it is the law in a Bay College policy, but also um, it's the right thing to do. Um, and so we, we try to convey that in this module, as well as provide people with um, assistive technologies and places on campus where they can get some support and resources. The second module um, dives into uh, accessible content page creation and curation. Um, we go over the web content accessibility guidelines and um, we show people how to actually apply the principles within our learning management system. Blackboard, that's our primary, and then we have a secondary um, uh, learning management system, GenSpar's e-learning, um, but we actually show them how to do that so that they can turn around and do it in their own course. The third module is over accessible documents. Um, we help uh, people to uh, learn about accessible Word documents, Google documents, uh, PowerPoints, PDFs, um, and not only how to create them, but how to retrofit existing documents. Um, and then we also introduce the Blackboard Ally tool, which is a tool inside of Blackboard, um, which helps identify accessibility barriers. Um, but I will leave that for Edie to expound upon here in a minute. And then our last module uh, discusses the uh, creation and curation of accessible video content. Uh, we talk about uh, production quality of videos and how to caption uh, videos specifically in uh, Bake's preferred hosting service Panopto and using our caption service provider, 3Play Media. We also show people how to um, evaluate videos that they might get elsewhere, like on YouTube. Um, so how can we be sure that these are accessible videos before we embed them in our um, content pages in Blackboard or link to them, um, et cetera. Lastly, um, we have some evaluation methods that we implement through the course. Um, for each module, there are uh, quizzes, discussion forums where they are interacting with other students in the course and um, collaborating. And then we also have assignments. Um, these are hands-on assignments where we have uh, students in the course actually take um, something from their own course, maybe a document or a content page and um, apply the principles that they've learned to make the document or the page more accessible. Um, so that's a hands-on type assignment, as well as throughout the entirety of the course, um, students are creating an accessibility plan. 
to implement to one of their own courses. Um, so by the end of the course, they have a tangible plan that they can implement to um, kind of bit by bit work on increasing their accessibility of their courses. Um, and then there is a mastery test at the end of the course. Um, so this is just a quick overview of our web accessibility certification course. Uh, we This is an open educational resource. We um, developed it from this one project and adapted it for um, Bay College. So that is the overview. I'm going to hand it off to Edie where, and she's gonna talk more about Ally. Thanks, I'm not really Joseph. I just changed my name, so it actually is my name. I can turn my video on here for a second. <laughs> We're a little bit of a hot mess. I was just over at, at campus meeting our new president and literally turned around and came back. It's a 40 minute drive each way. So <laughs> I was coming in hot, so we're a bit of a mess. Um, so I'm gonna turn this off because you don't need to see my face anyway. I'll share my screen. I need to find the right window. Okay, so I am gonna be sharing, you guys can see that, right? Okay, good. Um, so I'm gonna be sharing about Blackboard Allies. So like Lindsay said, that is our accessibility tool that we use in Blackboard. Um, and it has three main functions. It provides support for students, instructors, and administrators. So for students, the primary function is that it provides a multiple means of access for them. Um, so I'm going to show you what that looks like in Blackboard as a student. So this is our online teaching certification class. Um, so as a student, they'll see these icons throughout the class. It's super simple. They're attached to any content page or document that's uploaded to the class. They can click on that and it will pro uh, provide a list of different formats that they can use um, to download this. Um, so that's really helpful for whatever type of accommodation the students need. And this is all automatically created through Blackboard Ally. So once the instructor creates the content page or once they upload a document, um, it's automatically um, processed through Ally. Um, the, the actual file isn't created until somebody requests it. So if I wanted an audio file for this page, um, if I'm the first user to do this, it might take a little bit of time for it to generate. Um, but once one user has generated it, then it's quicker for the um, other students, but it's all automatic. There's nothing extra the instructor has to do it's all right there. Um, so that's basically the student end of it. It looks the same throughout. The consistency makes it a lot easier for students. Um, so it's not like it looks one way on one page and one way on a different page. Um, for instructors, uh, their two primary functions is checking the accessible content to make sure it is accessible. And for things that aren't accessible or not ideally accessible, it provides guidance for either making it accessible or making it more accessible. Um, so we'll look at the instructor side. Um, in the class, there's a few different way, ways for the instructor to access Ally. The easiest is when they're in the class, they'll see these gas gauges um, that show their accessibility score for each item. And they can click on that. And it will show their overall accessibility score. It tells them what the score means. So what is accessible about this image? Um, it gives tips for how to improve. So if the description maybe isn't that good, Blackboard what doesn't know if his description is good or not. So um, you can always review that. Um, and for this instance, it could be marked as decorative because it's an image. But depending on what type of file it is, it's going to give different guidance. If it's a PDF or if it's a Word document, it's going to be looking for different things. Um, so it will provide feedback in different ways, depending on um, what it comes up with. Um, another nice thing about this, while I've got this open, is whatever changes need to be made, a lot of them can be made right within this window. So you don't have to like download the file, make your edits, re-upload it. You can make your changes right here. There are some types of files where you would need to download it and then re-upload it, but you can do it right here as well. Um, so if I wanted to replace this, with a new file, I could do that right here if it was a Word document or something like that. Um, so the instructors don't have to look all over the class to find where the image is at. It's right within this thing. Um, another way they can access it, and this is actually my preferred method for accessing um, Blackboard Ally, is through our content collection. 
this brings up every document in the course. I'm in student preview, so it's not going to show me anything. There we go. Open our content collection. And you can see on here, it's going to give an accessibility score for every single um, file that's been uploaded in the course. Some of these things may not be used in the course anymore. So it's a good way to review your documents too, to make sure you're using everything that's actually in there. Um, but instructors can make revisions from right here as well. So this is a, oh, that's my face. Let's pick a different one. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody wants to see that. Okay, so this is a better example. Um, it's going to tell us what our score is. So this is not an accessible image. It's only 5% accessible. We can click all issues to see what the problem is. So we have contrast issues, um, and we also are missing our description. So we can click on this, click on how to write a good description. It will give us examples of how to make the most of our description. We don't want things to be too wordy or whatever, um, but we want to make sure we're getting across the point of this image. Um, also, if there's text on an image, we want to make sure that's included. Um, but the instructors have all of that right in front of them to make those changes. Um, now, this one, the contrast issue, you can't fix that right within um, Blackboard. So you would have to download this image, make it more accessible for contrast, and then re-upload it. But you can do it right here. And if this image is on five different page, pages in the course, it'll update it on all five pages. You wouldn't have to find it every single spot. Um, it would update it automatically. So that's really handy for the instructors. Um, so I think I hit everything there that we needed to look at for the instructor side. Um, and then the last one was the admin side. Okay, so for our admin side, um, this is our reporting function. Um, when you first load your Ally report, it will always show these graphs and charts. Um, by default, it is by term, but you can change it to whatever metric you need. Um, and it's just a good overview of your progress over time um, within Blackboard. And you can see some semesters we do better than others as far as um, making sure our documents and everything are accessible. And you can see consistently our files are the least accessible. Um, and I think that that's pretty normal um, because if you're building something right within the text editor, it's pretty much straight text. Anytime you start adding documents with images and things like that, it does get a little trickier. So you can scroll down and see a little bit more information. Our overall accessibility score is a 79.3%, which is pretty good. Um, it is down compared to our winter semester, but I think that's a pretty good number. And then if you continue scrolling, you can look at all of the um, errors within the classes. So this first page orders it by the number of issue, specific types of issues. So our number one issue is that an image does not have a description. We have 830 instances of that um, in our courses. Um, typically when I'm looking for things that we need to review, I always go right to the severe. Um, if you look at the severe, those are almost always PDF documents that are not scanned. Um, so as you click through these things, it gets obviously more and more um, narrowly focused on where your issues are. So if I were to click on this, it's going to show me every class that has courses that, not, that are not OCR. So we're not going to open from that because I don't want to um, embarrass anybody if they have a whole bunch of <laughs> inaccessible things in their class. Um, but I can show you what it looks like. I took a screenshot and um, cleared up. Oh, the information. Oh, Henry's choking on his tongue over here. Um, so back to our slides. This is a screenshot. Where did it go? There's an image here, and I don't know. Can you see this image? It's looking white on my side. I don't know. Where it went. It's not white on my end, Edie. I can share my screen if you stop. Yeah, do you want yeah, do you want to just share it? I'll stop sharing. Yeah, I don't know why it was showing as white on my side. That's really weird. But this is just an example of what the course report would look like once you click on um 
whatever type of error you're looking for. This class had the most errors. It had 26 accessibility issues and every single one was a PDF issue. Um, so it just gives you a good starting point of what instructors you should be reaching out to, which classes have more needs than others. Um, and you can really focus it on whatever you're looking for. So if you're wanting to focus on making sure images are captioned properly, it's really easy to find who your big offenders are. Or if you really wanna focus on PDFs, you can find that really easily. And it's not a punitive thing. We never use this as like, you know, you're in so much trouble for not doing this. We're just looking for who we need to reach out to, out to and who needs support um, and who just needs some extra help. A lot of our instructors that we run into with these are typically adjuncts. So, I mean, like an adjunct doesn't get all of the extra time and funding that a full-time instructor would get. So um, a lot of times they do need a little bit of extra help, but that's basically Ally in a nutshell. I feel like it's made things a really, um, a lot easier for our faculty to make the changes that they need in the easiest way possible. They don't have to have 15 different programs to make an, a document accessible. They don't have to have all of these different scanners to check for different things. That pretty much everything that they need to check for is being checked for an ally and it's providing immediate support for them and feedback for them. Um, when they're uploading documents. And I think that's all I've got, unless anybody's got any questions about Ally. I had a question. Um, how long did it take to get Ally to where it is today? And how long did it take for faculty members to become more acquainted with using it? I don't think it actually took all that long. Ally has gotten better. When it first began, it was just documents. So PDFs and Word documents and images. Um, they recently, well, I don't know how recently it was, but they added the text editor. So that's been nice. So now pretty much everything that's in Blackboard is being scanned. But for faculty, I feel like they were pretty much on board right from the beginning. We had lots of questions about how do I get my stuff accessible? But as far as them using Ally to scan their stuff and find where the problems were, I think it's pretty immediate because nobody wants to see those little red gas gauges in their class. So they want to get rid of those. And they were pretty on board with reaching out if they needed help and couldn't figure out how to fix it on their own. I'm curious about any faculty feedback that you've gotten about, I'm sorry, <laughs> I have a lot of questions. This is very interesting no, to me. Um, what kind of faculty feedback have you gotten about using this? They haven't complained about it. So I take that as a win because <laughs> um, if they had a problem with it, we would know. Um, but I feel like faculty have been all on board with it because it is so easy and it's so intuitive to use. Um, I don't know, Joseph, maybe you're the, they complain to Joseph more than they complain to me. So um, he may have a different op opinion on that, but I feel like- they I think that, you know, over time, it's, uh, things have changed a lot. Um, and, uh, you know, I think the initial concern from anyone, and that's, that's this isn't just faculty, this is also staff, you know. Um, but yeah, Lindsay, you can- uh, stop sharing and then we can go to full screen mode here the um the the thing is, is that i think that it takes so much time um and that is one of the things that i am really hopeful for about with ai is that um it they develop some tools that could really help people with uh accessibility but um it does take a lot of time uh, to make sure that all of your documents are accessible. And I think what happens is that when you learn initially some strategies on how to be successful uh, and accessible, your head kind of explodes because you're like, wow, I, I'm, I'm going to have to do this for like everything in my class. And then for me as an administrator, your head explodes even farther because it's like, not only does it have to be for you, but it has to be for all. And, and, you know, all the classes, all the content, and not only that, but 
all of our websites and our intranets and everything, everywhere, you know, is, that's the ideal, right? But the only way that that could ever be possible is, is that everybody's got to be on board. Everybody has to go through some sort of training. Every, everyone creates digital documents. And so therefore it is important that everyone go through some sort of accessibility training. And I think what our office has tried to do is, is to be uh, that support for not only faculty, but staff um, to, to help them get connected with, you know, how to create accessible documents. It looks like Holly's got her hand up. I have lots of questions too, Precious. So um, can we start with what is your staffing model to support this effort? So specifically, what's the name of the department? How many um, staff members? What, you know, faculty, admin, that sort of thing. So we've always, I mean, when I first started here 12 years ago, um, there was a real deficit in web accessibility. And, um, and that became very apparent to me. And um, our Office of Accessibility doesn't necessarily understand all the technology, all the technology behind uh, web accessibility and digital accessibility. Um, and so that wasn't necessarily a responsibility of that office. And it was just kind of, no one's responsibility and so i took it on i was like look we have to you know we have to be concerned about web accessibility and um i started at the university of toledo you know working towards digital accessibility when i was there before i came here so it is just our office it is just the office of online learning and we have you know there are three people in our office um, but it is also the Office of Accessibility, which is uh, one person, uh, Carrie Meenier, and um, but she's handling the day-to-day, -day, you know, functionality of, uh, you know, students getting the accommodations that they need. And that is where the majority of her job uh, rests, is with helping students on a day-to-day -day basis getting the accommodations that they need to materials. Um, but the Office of Accessibility can also help remediate perhaps some videos that need to get captioned and log into our three play, our three play media account and you know do some urgent requests things of that nature. So it's a team effort in that regard, but it, it is our office primarily that works towards web accessibility and does the web accessibility training, um, and and then we try to train faculty and and staff in that regard. So. Um, I saw the gap and filled it. Yeah, and it kind of did go from nobody's responsibility to now it really is everybody's responsibility. Faculty understand that they have to be creating accessible content. Staff are creating accessible content. We're here to support them, but they're the ones that need to be creating it. Um, so it is everybody's job. Um, we're just there to make sure that they're having what they need and answering their questions when they run into sticky things. but. And I actually included it in my job description, and it is now part of Edie's job description, and it is part of the reason why we got to hire Lindsay too, is because we really needed help um, filling that gap, and so Lindsay helps to fill that gap too. Okay. Another question I had was, um, what kind of directive was given to all the employees of your campus, and who gave that directive? So the directive primarily originally came from the top, which was from the president, right? We need to be web accessible. It's the law. We receive federal funds. So we don't have much of a choice when it comes to being accessible. It is federal law. Uh, if you receive federal funds, you are required to adhere to the ADA law. And, uh, and so it started there, but I will say that um, for me, I report to the VP of Academics. And so the VP of Academics often sends out emails to folks to let them know that, look, this is the law and we are bound by the law and we have a department to help you become you know, compliant. 
Okay. And I think my last one in that train of questions was, um, are employees required to take the certification? And if it's not all of them, what does that look like? Um, yeah. So no, they are not required to do the web accessibility certification course. Um, we do have small cohorts that proceed through the course together, and um, it's a four week long course. However, we do offer trainings and we use the web accessibility certification course as the foundation for 15 minute trainings that we do and record or and then share via Zoom or live one on one workshops where we use the web accessibility course to show them the five most important things, you know, descriptive URLs, alt tags, captions, headings, uh, things of that nature. And, and so we can use that course as a hub for delivering uh, kind of training that goes from 15 minutes to an hour to four weeks long. Uh, but no, they're not required. What we have done is try to incentivize, you know, people completing the course by giving them little plaques and, and things of that nature. And so uh, we have done that. Um, Part of what I really want to present to this group is like, I would really like to create a course collaboratively across institutions that we could offer through perhaps ETOM, the uh, you know Education Technology Organization of Michigan, and uh, Bay College could be a hub, uh, you know, for that, and we could charge a small fee, but. Mm -hmm. Um, for institutions that have helped and participated, you know, there would, you know, be, um, there would be no fee, right? So um, I would really like to get a group together that's interested in creating something that we could do at a more, you know, community college of Michigan level. Um, that, that's one of the questions I would like to present to this group is because uh, the problem with federal law is this they just say you have to be compliant they don't tell you you need this certification from this company and they let you just do what you need to do to be compliant but really you do need some sort of training program put together right i i think that would be brilliant because as you know it seems like such a huge mountain to climb um and we're all under-resourced, right? Um, and so if if we could find a team of people that could create a kind of universal access um, platform for, for all community colleges, that would be extremely helpful. Um, yeah, I mean, I think some of the things that we would have to work on, maybe there is, um, you know, you use Blackboard, we use Moodle. Um, so even if we had in that chapter, or so to speak, you had a Moodle option um, demo and you had a Blackboard, um, that could that could yeah, help. And that's exactly what I was hoping is that we could get institutions that use, you know, we use Blackboard Learn and there are institutions that use Blackboard Ultra. So that's a little different, that's a lot different. And then, you know, you have Moodle and then you have Desire to Learn and then you have Canvas. And so there is a lot of universal language and knowledge in the course that would apply to no matter what learning management system you're using. However, we have customized our course to our learning management system. So I guess, you know, what I was thinking is that we could partner with other institutions that use different LMSs and build pieces of those modules that would make sure that they cover those different learning management systems. Because quite honestly, like the, the modules that you were talking about, you know, the what is accessibility, that's standard, um, accessible web design, that's standard, accessible document design, that's standard. So it's really just those applications to your internal specific platforms. Um, accessible video content, you would have some pieces that you would be unique based on um, what platforms you use for video development or to, to caption um, videos that you're using from someone else or things like that. But a lot of that's pretty standard too. So yeah, 
you know, we have a lot of tutorials in the course that show people how to use different aspects of our like WYSIWYG editor and Blackboard, you know, and using the uh, accessibility checker and that. We also have stuff specific to our intranet, which is called uh, Genzabar's, you know, uh, my, well, we call it MyVay, but it's like their e-learning product. And, um, and so it's kind of, you know, we've customized a lot of that language to our, you know, campus, but um, it is an open educational resource and it is something that we could develop and customize and uh, offer to other community colleges or I mean for that matter it doesn't have to be a community college either it could be a uh, university too. I'm on board how do we make that happen? I'm wondering if we could pull in some conversation around the digital accessibility affinity group mm -hmm. and begin some dialogue in that um, in that space. Um, we, I am wondering if we could do a poll uh, to gauge who, uh, what everyone's availability would be to meet on a more regular basis. Um, about every four to six weeks is what we've kind of been talking about uh, prior to today's convening. Um, so either in the chat or you can be uh, brave and unmute and share what day and time works for you to um, attend an affinity group meeting. Does Tuesday afternoons generally work for the group? I don't have any standard meetings at that time. Tuesday mornings I do, but afternoons would be fine. Okay. Tuesday works great. Thank you, David. Yeah, I think maybe a little bit later in the afternoon, like uh, 2.30, sure. 3. Yeah. 3 even. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 3 p.m. Tuesdays. Uh, I know we have several Kellogg Community College um, employees on the call, too. Um, Ron just said 3 p.m. at the latest for him. Okay. Um, anybody else from Kellogg um, have a time constraint on Tuesdays? Should you tell me it's Barbara? Um, it's going to depend. You know, yeah. if I'm on cabinet, I won't be available. Um, there are some meetings that aren't standard set, but will happen. Um, it's really hard to say if it could be a standing time that's available yeah. for me. Sorry, it's not good. to be difficult. No, that's okay. Tammy just posted that academic cabinet meetings are Tuesdays from 2.30 to 4.30. Um, and so that, that will take some people. Do you meet every week for academic cabinet? Is it on your calendar, Barbara or Tammy? Um, it's not for me. The chairs and directors rotate. Oh. And then if I have, if I'm um, asked to be there, because of a issue or a course that happens, you know, periodically also. Okay. okay. But I'm not a I'm not a standing member. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah, you know, we could also send out like when is good or something, you know, and yeah. pick the time slot that most people can can make it to or something. Yeah. And I I'm, I'm not open. saying yeah, I don't think Tuesdays is off limit for us. Um because again, even the people on this call um, may or may not choose to participate in in that discussion or that sort of thing. So, is anybody using a different a learning management system that's interested in working on this project? Just Moodle and Blackboard. It sounds like. Well, you know, um, this is Dave uh, from Kalamazoo Valley. Um, we use Canvas, and I'd be interested in working on this. Awesome. Great. Dave, what is your role at KBCC? I'm an instructional designer. Oh, fabulous. And what does your department structure look like? Well, Gail Fredericks is at the top. She runs the uh, uh, Faculty Success Center, and then there's the rest of us. So there's myself. I'm right now the sole instructional designer and we got three other folks who focus on that like the technicalities but um we all have our hands in accessibility to one degree or another molly and myself probably have the most um okay. experience with accessibility issues perfect thank you mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I agree. We want to try to be as universal to all learning management system platforms. So um, that would be the goal is to have all the major players, you know, um, have a say and, and and have people that are familiar with those LMSs build out that particular part of the content. Um, we, it was mentioned, ETAM was mentioned. Um, does somebody want to explain that in case there are members of this group that aren't familiar with that? Sure. Uh, ETAM is a great group. Uh, it's a group that I've been part of for a long time. And it's essentially the, um, you know, Education Technology Organization of Michigan. And we just had our summer retreat just recently. Um, and um, they run like an online teaching certification course. Uh, we have a conference coming up in the fall that's in Detroit, I believe it's Schoolcraft College. And uh, I haven't really <laughs> talked to Gary or the standing president right now about this, but I think they'd be very open to the idea and using ETOM as a, uh, a platform to uh, distribute the knowledge because ETOM is open not only to community colleges, but also to four-year institutions like uh, Northern uh, belongs to ETOM, Northern Michigan belongs to ETOM. Uh, the, I think, you know, Michigan State has come to some of our events. Um, so it's a, it's an organization that is centered around education technology. Well, and, you know, I think the goal is to see um, a, a training tool like this developed. And I don't think, it, to me, it doesn't matter who does the developing or who owns it, um, you know, that sort of thing. Because if if we can have support of, of other colleges and universities, even um, to help with the development, that's, you know, that's well, only going to- And that's the joy of OERs, is open educational resources are, are, are open for all to use and to share. Uh, it, you know, it's CC BY, this particular course. And, you know, and so you're giving, uh, you're, you're giving credit to the California Consortium on Community Colleges yeah. at one. And if you're using some of our stuff, give us credit, but it's not, that's the joy of OERs. And that would be, that would be the, the agreeing principle that we all agree on is that this is going to be an open educational resource and we can use it how we decide we want to use it. If you want to use it, take it and use it at your, as your institute at your particular institution and use it as a certification tool. Uh, great. Go for that. But I also think it would be great to develop something that covers all LMSs and offer it through something like ETEM. Yeah. Sherry, um, she might, oh, Sherry's still with us. She just posted in the chat. Um, she's from NMC and is interested um, in this further and shared her um, email contact as well. Kendra says she would like, wants to be applicable across all available platforms. We use D2L Brightspace. Yeah, I think that's like a lot of the big players, right? Blackboard, Learn and Ultra, Brightspace, D2L, Canvas, Moodle. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not sure what, those are the big ones. Yeah. And I really think it's easy enough using the structure that you put in place um, to have all of the universal um, content that's applicable regardless of what platforms you're using kind of at the top and then you talk about lms systems well that's redundant lms <laughs> um, and then you would have breakouts for that um, of all the major players so yep sounds good let's do it yes <laughs> <laughs> I like that can do attitude. Let's do this. I'm going to place a link in the chat. Um, it is a link to a, um, a subscription list where you can subscribe to get updates about affinity group meetings, coming events, um, webinars, grant opportunities. I'll share through that platform as well, along with the PowerPoint slides from today's presentation. Um, so if you wouldn't mind subscribing, that would be great. And um, if you, I hope you have a great rest of your afternoon. I wasn't quite sure how to end this, um, but I appreciate your time this afternoon and I hope you guys are well.
Um, thank you. Yeah, thanks for organizing it, Precious. Appreciate it. My pleasure. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Bye.